in class we've discussed um, spring potential energy and we've discussed gravitational potential energy as examples, illustrations of potential energy. I wanted to look at an example problem that involves both spring potential energy and gravitational potential energy, a combination of those two potential energies. Uh, and so I picked this problem from the homework. So in this problem, we are told that we've got an arrangement that involves a pulley system, two masses, and a spring. And the arrangement involves these two pulleys on the left and right here, these two masses, M1, M2, on the left and right here, and then a single spring over here on the right. Now we're told that to begin with, we arrange the masses at equal heights, equal elevations, and the spring to be uncompressed, unstretched. And then we're gonna release the masses. And we're gonna figure out the displacement of the masses away from that initial elevation and the stretch of the spring as the masses move away from that initial elevation. And a key point is that mass M1 over here on the left is heavier than mass M2 over here on the right. So the gravitational pull of the heavier mass is bigger. The gravitational pull of the smaller mass is smaller. And the heavier mass will move downwards under the bigger gravitational force. And the lighter mass will move upwards under the gravitational force. And this will stretch the spring. And we've got to figure out this displacement of the two masses or this stretch of the spring. You know, at first sight, this might look like um, a horrible problem and you might feel you want to run away from it. It involves a pair of masses, it involves a spring, it involves two pulleys and the string. It's got a lot of parts, a lot of moving parts in this problem. But it's actually a fantastic example of how what looks like a, a complex, complicated problem can be solved simply using energy methods. And so it's, a, it's really a beautiful example of energy, energy methods, energy approaches. The idea is that that system involving the two masses in the spring starts out with a certain amount of energy. And after the you know, mass on the left falls, mass on the right rises, the spring gets stretched, that amount of energy is still the same. Now, the form of the energy is changed. Um, energy moves around between gravitational potential energy and spring potential energy. But overall, uh, energy was conserved. And so that's going to be our key starting point, that energy is conserved. And this problem involves two brands of energy, two types of energy, uh, gravitational potential energy and spring potential energy. And I'm going to solve it with energy conservation. You'll like this. OK, energy conservation. So I'm calling the initial system before, meaning before the movement of the masses. And the final arrangement, I'm calling that after, after the movement of the masses. So in between the before and after, right, the, the mass on the left is falling and the mass on the right is rising. We're, we're really just interested in the before situation, before we've released them 
and the after situation where they've come to rest. In both the before and the after situations then, there's no kinetic energies to worry about. Nothing's moving before we release them and nothing's moving after the mass on the left has fallen and the mass on the right has risen. And so we've just got to worry about the gravitational potential energy and the spring potential energy before and after. And the fact that that total energy before, I called it EB here, is equal to total energy after. Okay, so let's expand these energy befores and energy afters. So the energy before the movement is a sum of the gravitational potential energy of mass number one before the movement plus the gravitational potential energy of mass number two before the movement plus spring potential energy of the spring before the movement. Those are the three possible contributions to the total energy uh, before the masses move and the spring gets stretched. And then similarly, after the movement, the energy has contributions in principle from the um, gravitational potential energy of mass number one after the movement, gravitational potential energy of mass number two after the movement, and the spring potential energy of the spring after the movement. So that's a very general statement that the various contributions from gravitational potential energy and spring potential energy before the movement and after the movement must add up to be the same. I mean, the individual contributions can be different. Gravitational potential energy of the first mass can be different before and after, but the sum of all these contributions must be the same before and after. So now all we got to do is fill them in. Now, I'm going to use the original position here in red I'm going to call that elevation or that height. I'm going to call that the zero. And that's just convenient in this problem. And, and I'm going to write down gravitational potential energies with respect to that height, that, that zero elevation. Uh, the nice thing about that is then, well, the gravitational potential energy of mass number one before the motion was a zero height. So mg times the height or the elevation is going to be zero. The gravitational potential energy of mass two before the movement, that's also going to be zero because um, mg times the height of mass two, that's going to be zero. And actually the spring potential energy, because the springs initially neither stretched nor compressed, that's also zero. So the left-hand side the contributions of energies from the masses and the spring, they're all zero and they add up to zero. So that's really simple. Now on the right hand side, we just got to fill in the contributions to the energy, the gravitational potential energy contributions, the spring potential energy contributions um, after the movement. So for mass number one, its contribution will be its um, to the gravitational potential energy will be its mass times the acceleration of gravity times its height. And that's now minus D. It's below the original elevation. The contribution of mass number two to the gravitational potential energy will be its mass times the acceleration of gravity times its height, it's now plus D, it's above its original elevation. And then the spring's contribution 
to the energy be, will be one half k times the square of the amount that we've stretched it and the amount we stretched it is d and so that's d squared and so these are the three contributions to the energy the total energy from the gravitational potential energy and spring potential energy after the movement well now we've made a little equation if you look at it uh, that contains some things we know, at least symbols we know. The masses M1 and M2, we're considering those as known. Um, the spring constant, we're considering that as known. And the other thing contained in the equation is um, the displacement D, how much the system moved. And that's what we want to figure out. Interestingly, because we've got zero over here on the left-hand side of the equation, we can cancel out a common factor of D in each of these three terms on the right-hand side of the equation. So we can cancel this D, this D, and one of these Ds in the D squared. And then if we separate the terms with the accelerations of gravity from the terms with the spring constant to left and right hand sides of the equations and divide through by the spring constant and multiply through by two, we get the following equation for D, that D will be equal to the difference in the two masses, heavier minus the lighter, times the acceleration of gravity, times two, divided by the spring constant. And that is the amount that the two masses will move and the amount that the spring gets stretched. And as I say, We've been able to solve that in a simple way using energy conservation, that the energy before and the energy after are the same. Um, that means that the sum of all the contributions before and after to the, to the energy, the gravitational potential energy, the spring potential energy contributions must add up to be the same. And then by filling in those equations that we met for spring potential energy and gravitational potential energy in terms of the amount that you stretch or compress a spring, the amount that you raise or lower a mass, we're able to solve for the displacement of the masses and the stretching of the spring. And we get a result that makes a lot of, a lot of sense. So supposing the masses were actually the same size, M1 and M2 are equal. Then, because we've got the displacement proportional to the difference in the masses, there would be no displacement and the string spring would never get stretched. We find that the amount that the spring gets stretched is in proportion to the difference in the masses. The more different the mass is, the greater the stretch of the spring. And that probably makes sense. Also, we find that the stretch of the spring is in inverse proportion to the spring constant. So the stronger the spring, the less it will stretch. The weaker the spring, the more it will stretch. And that makes sense too. So there's a lot of sensible things in the equation. Finally, it also depends on the acceleration of gravity. So that the amount that the masses will move and the spring will get stretched depends on whether you do this on Earth or you do it on the moon. If you did it on the moon, there would be less stretch. If you did it on Jupiter, gravity is bigger, you get more stretch. So it depends on the acceleration of gravity. Without acceleration of gravity, if you did this in empty space, free space, outer space, then nothing would move. Anyway, so as I say, a beautiful example of energy conservation, spring potential energy, gravitational kinetic energy.